we're going to talk about how to relax, how to do that spiritually. No, really, the question that we want to speak to in relationship to what we looked at in 2 Thessalonians chapter 1 this morning, how do you not only survive, but how do you actually thrive in affliction, in trial, in evil days like we're living in? Well, you have to learn to spiritually relax. As Paul puts it in 2 Thessalonians 1 verse 7, he says, rest with us. Remember, I said this morning, that means release. Like uh, the string of a bow is released from its tension and just is no longer taut and tight, but is, again, loose. So, relax, rest. You need to rest. You need to learn how to spiritually rest. You know what I'm talking about? You know how that happens? <laughs> There used to be a commercial on, uh, I don't know, radio, TV, about Sleepies. Is Sleepies still a mattress company that's uh, working? Are they still around? Yep. Remember Sleepies? You go to Sleepies for the rest of your life? That's a play on words, right? It's a play on words. It, it can mean you'll find rest on a mattress there, but you'll also find rest on a mattress for the rest of your life. Well, we need as believers to learn how to find the rest of our life. And it is found in the words of Jesus. Did I ask you to open your Bible to Matthew 11? Matthew chapter 11, if you'll do that with me. Very famous words that probably all of us have heard and uh, perhaps have heard messages on or have thought about those wonderful words, this invitation that is open to anyone and everyone in Matthew eleven twenty eight and verse 29, where Jesus says, look at it with me, come unto me, all ye that are weary and heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon me and learn of me and ye shall find rest unto your souls. Let's pause a moment once again and pray. Lord, we know how to rest physically. At least I think we do. We stop and we, we recline and, or we, we sleep. But Lord, I'm afraid that a lot of us who are believers, do not understand how to rest spiritually. And that's what you want us to learn. So I pray that we would take your word to heart, that you would give us understanding, and that it would be more than hearing, that we would become doers of your word. That's where the blessing lies. The Lord, enable us to have anointed ears, and anointed lips, for your name's sake, we pray. Amen. He said, come unto me, all ye that are weary. I want to talk about weariness before we talk about restfulness. Let's talk about weariness just a moment. You know, hard work or a lack of sleep can certainly make you tired. And I have to be honest, the older I get... <laughs> I don't know if it's related to some disease I have or what, but there are moments when I just have overwhelming waves of fatigue wash over me. You know what I'm talking about? And I just tell my wife, oh, I got to lay down. I, I can't go anymore. There is a deeper fatigue, however, than that kind of physical bodily tiredness. There is a weariness within the human soul, and you and I all experience it. A spiritual and an emotional weariness. Let's talk about emotional weariness for a moment. He says, come unto me, all ye that are weary. Emotional weariness is a real thing with human beings because we are emotional. We have emotions. 
And those emotions sometimes just get exhausted. But we get exhausted from experiencing heavy burdens. He says, come unto me, all ye that are weary and heavy laden. That could refer to, first of all, perhaps emotional uh, weariness, where we are just drained from maybe a crisis or a series of crises that we've gone through or a crisis that we're in the middle of, where we're tired within our soul from carrying a weight. Sometimes it's from carrying other people's weights for them and with them. We become tired emotionally. And you know what? You can go on the best luxury vacation, but still carry a burden with you and be weighed down inside of you emotionally in your inner person. So there is a real emotional weariness. And I think that Jesus is first and, and uh, perhaps uh, very simply speaking to an emotional weariness. But that's not where it stops. I know he's not talking about a physical weariness. We know how to take care of that. We don't always do it, but we know how to take care of it. I think he's talking more about a spiritual weariness. Come unto me, all ye that are spiritually weary and spiritually heavy laden. And he says, you'll find restfulness if you come my way. Now, when Jesus says that, I think he's talking, or at least implying, about three different kinds of spiritual weariness that human beings uh, suffer. Spiritual weariness is produced by, and it's the result always, of self-effort. It's the result of us relying upon ourselves instead of relying upon God. If you do that in these three areas, guarantee you, you're going to get worn out spiritually. What are these three areas that he, I think, is implying when he says, come unto me, all ye that are weary and heavy laden spiritually? I think, first of all, he's talking about salvation. Come unto me, all ye that are weary and heavy laden. I think he's talking to people who are simply worn out by following the demands of a particular religion. In this case, it's the Pharisaical Judaism that uh, they were taught and that they were following. It's the same type of Judaism that uh, the Jewish people are following traditionally today. Traditional Judaism is Talmudic Judaism. They say that, they, that they're that they following the Torah. They're not following the first five books of Moses. They're following what their sages and what the rabbinic interpretation and uh, an addition to Moses' five books uh, teach. They're following man's traditions. And that will wear you out. Whether you be a Jewish person following Judaism as a religion, or Catholicism as a Roman Catholic, or uh, Eastern Orthodox, Russian Orthodox, whatever you want to call it, um, uh, Islam. These are all religions that wear out their followers because they demand a particular rigor that you have to follow. There is a list of do's and don'ts that you must observe if you're going to get to heaven or wherever, nirvana or um, paradise, whatever you want to call it, whatever the religion calls it. Here's the thing, folks. You know what Peter said at that Council of Jerusalem in Acts chapter 10? He lays it out very clearly. And he says in Acts 15, 10, something to this effect. You know, we can't require these Gentiles from the nations that are believing upon Jesus, the Messiah, as their Savior. We can't require them to be circumcised and, and keep a kosher diet like, like uh, we have been taught from our child. We can't do that because, remember, this was a yoke. This was such a heavy burden. None of us have been able to fulfill it. And so people are coming 
and trying to earn salvation by following the demands of a, of a particular religion. They struggle. They try their hardest to measure up, and they never know if they've done enough to balance the scales. You know, that's, that's human religion. Religion is all about balancing the scales, making sure that your good works are heavier than your bad works. That's not biblical. That's religion, okay? And that will wear you out. When Jesus says, come unto me, all ye that are weary and heavy laden, he's talking to religionists. He's talking to people that are trying to earn their way to get whatever God they're worshiping to find his favor, to be saved. But there's a second spiritual weariness that Jesus implies in those words, come unto me, all you the weary and heavy laden. And I believe that it is a weariness that comes from serving. As believers, as true born-again people, we can become spiritually weary in serving the Lord. And by that, I mean this. Zealous believers who are doing all that they can for the Lord's work because their thinking is this. They think the more that they can serve, the more people will praise them and perhaps the more points they'll earn and they are exhausting themselves in the process. That is not the basis for serving God as a believer. It's not about what people think about us, and it's not about what God thinks about us either. That's not the motivation for serving the Lord. And if we ever serve God on that basis because we feel the constraint of what people would think if we don't, or if uh, we're afraid that God's going to punish us if we don't serve in a, in a certain capacity, let me tell you, that will spiritually wear you out. And there is what is called in ministry burnout. There are pastors that have quit the ministry and that are today maybe selling life insurance or working some other kind of secular job because they were serving the Lord through self-effort. And as a result, they burned themselves out because self only has so much strength. And after a while, it can't go anymore. And so they burn themselves out because, and they become weary and heavy laden by serving in self-effort. There's a third thing that I believe that Jesus implies about spiritual weariness here. Not only concerning those that are trying to be saved through self-effort, not only believers that are trying to serve the Lord through self-effort, but thirdly, Believers that are trying to be holy or sanctify themselves by self-effort. Believers that are struggling to be good Christians and to make themselves uh, uh, more, look more acceptable uh, in the eyes of their brothers and sisters. Believers that are trying to manufacture what looks right as a Christian and uh, and. They fool a lot of people. A lot of people think, you know, that they're, they're, they're real, but they're actually fake reproductions that have been made by self-effort. We don't make ourselves good. We don't make ourselves holy. We don't make ourselves godly. If we are doing that, if we are just trying to live the Christian life, and, and I, I'm telling you, I, I don't say anything a lot of times. But when any believer says to me, well, you know, pastor, I'm trying my hardest. It just tells me they don't get it. And they may be trying their hardest, but eventually they're going to come to the place where they're going to get burned out in that area. They're not going to they're not going to ever achieve that level of holiness that they're shooting for because they're relying upon themselves. Can I say this without being misunderstood? Stop trying to live the Christian life. Stop trying to live for Jesus. Because that's not what it's about. And that will bring about spiritual wickedness deeply into your life. So what's the answer? Jesus says, first of all, come unto me. 
So let's talk about restfulness. How can we go from weariness to restfulness? He says, come to me, all you that labor and are heavy, heavy laden, and I will give you rest. He says, learn of me and you shall find rest under your soul. There are two kinds of rests in verse 28 and 29 when you look at them together. Notice it. There is a rest that is offered by Jesus, a rest that he gives. Come unto me, weary, heavy laden, I'll give you rest. But there's a second rest in verse 29, a second kind of rest, I should say. He said, learn of me and you will find rest. Verse 28, I'll give you rest. Verse 29, you'll find or discover rest. So there's two kinds of restfulness. There is a restfulness that is offered, and there is a restfulness that is discovered. Let's look at the first one. Come to me, and I will give you rest. By the way, it's so simple, isn't it? You obtain restfulness by coming to a person, but not just any person. You obtain spiritual restfulness by coming to Jesus. He says, come. That's the first step. You come to him. You come to the Lord. You don't come to the pastor. You don't come to a brother or sister. You come directly to Jesus. Jesus says, come to me, and I will give you rest. You simply obtain it by coming to Jesus. And notice he says, I'll give you rest. You have to take it as a gift. It's unearned. It's not based on your effort. It's something that is given you freely by the Lord, and it's only yours if you, number one, come to him, and when you come to him, you take it. You have to receive it, just like you receive the gift of life. If he's talking about salvation here, then it makes all the sense in the world, doesn't it? If you are weary and heavy laden because you've been following the rigorous demands of religion and it has trampled you and wearied you to the point where, what's the use? Jesus says, if you will take a step and come to me, I will offer you something that you could never earn. I'll give you I'll give you rest that is not through your self effort. You have to take it as a gift. And Jesus said this or, or rather John said this in John 1 he said he, that Jesus came to his own and his own received him not but he said as many whoever receives him he gives them the power or the right to become a child of God. It's a free gift, and every free gift has to be received. We could be offered a gift from now to doomsday, but if we never take that gift, what good does it do us? You have to, if it's a, a, a physical, material gift, you have to reach out your hand and receive that gift and claim it, for yourself by taking it in hand. If Jesus says, if you'll come to me, I'll give you a free gift of restfulness, you don't get it automatically. You have to come and ask him for it and then take it by the hand of faith. By faith, take the rest that he's offering you. It's an offered rest. It's not an earned rest. It's a gift that's given to you. I'll give you rest. You come as a weary sinner, burdened with conviction of sin, and you come into the living into a living personal relationship with Jesus. You receive Jesus as your personal Savior from sin. You receive Jesus as your life. And spiritual restfulness begins. Religion, it passes away. And instead, you replace that demanding religion with a personal relationship with Jesus, with God. That's the gift. But look at verse 29. This is where we'll spend the rest of our time. He says again, 
take my yoke upon you and learn of me and you shall find rest. Not I'll give you rest, but you'll find rest. So there's a rest that's offered in verse 28. There's a rest that's discovered in verse 29. And this rest that he offers in verse 29 is more than resting because your sins have been forgiven. There is a deeper rest available to believers. And it is a rest that is found in a deeply satisfying, growing relationship in which you learn to depend upon Jesus and you are enabled to be effective in your serving him and to you, you learn to depend upon him to live his life in you and to serve through you. That's what this rest involves. Spiritual rest will happen as you're willing to come to Jesus, as you're willing to heed and follow his invitation. He says, come to me. Okay, he's speaking to Christians here now. He's speaking to followers. He's speaking to disciples. You consider yourself a disciple? You consider yourself a, a bona fide, genuine follower of Jesus? Okay, if you do, this is for you, okay? You weary and heavy laden? You, you worn out and burdened deeply because you've been involved in self-effort, trying to please God and, and please your brothers and sisters, trying to do it all maybe so that you look good and you'll feel good about yourself. And I say this often. People tell, you know, a uh, guy at work, he, he told me, you know, oh, I, I hadn't been to the Catholic Church for 50 years. I just started going back because my granddaughter was confirmed. And, uh, oh, it, I just so, I, I feel so good when I leave after that. I said, you know, religion will always make you feel good, but it can't make you good. That's self-effort. And so he says, my restfulness, and he's speaking to believers, I think, to disciples, followers, true followers in verse 29. He says, here's how you get it. You come to me and you take my yoke. Now, it's not talking about eggs. Not talking about eggs when, it used, when he talks about taking my yoke. I'll tell you what it means in a moment. But when he says, take my yoke upon you, he's simply, in other words, saying, he's implying a contented willingness to cooperate with God so that he can make you and me channels of his worldwide redemptive plan. God has a plan to redeem people in this world, and he does it through you and I. He'll do it through us where we are. That's his plan. And so he's, when he says, take my yoke upon, upon you, he's implying that you will have a, a contented willingness to cooperate with him in his redemptive plan. Now, take my yoke. I said yoke doesn't refer to eggs. Actually, it refers to us serving the Lord. When he says, take my yoke, the yoke was what was needed for two oxen to plow a field. Talking about working for the Lord. Working as a follower of Jesus. Serving the Lord. He says, how do you do that and, and still be restful at the same time? Well, you do it by taking his yoke upon you because in the 30th verse, he says, my yoke is easy. And he doesn't mean easy over. <laughs> my yoke is easy. In other words, it, it's, it's, a, it's, it's not a difficulty. You can rest being yoked in service for the Lord, being yoked with him. Take my yoke upon. So the yoke refers to plowing a field with oxen. When my dad was a little boy in, uh, in southeastern Pennsylvania, he grew up on a farm. And uh, it was in the early uh, or mid-20s, mid, mid to late 20s. They didn't have a tractor. They had two workhorses. And uh, I don't know if I'm named after one, but one of them was Jim. <laughs> I forgot what the other one was. But anyway, he said, these horses you know, he was a little guy, uh, let's say five, six years old. 
He said, I remember uh, going behind them and walking underneath them between their two legs. And they were just as gentle and just as, as peaceful as could be these huge workhorses. But he says uh, it was, uh, he helped his grandfather uh, put the yoke on these two workhorses to plow the field. It, they, they were a leather, uh, a leather thing that they put over the, the uh, neck of both these horses that would link them, hook them up together. Uh, here he's talking about, of course, uh, hooking up two oxen uh, to plow a field. So anyway, the yoke is about plowing. It's a work picture he's talking about. When you take his yoke, you are contentedly willing to cooperate with God in serving his purpose in this world. To take a yoke like you would hook up two workhorses or in that day two oxen, uh, you would connect them with each other. And uh, you would then have each of them depending on uh, depend working together as they plowed that field. So when Jesus said, take my yoke upon you, if you're going to rest, if you're going to serve me and still be restful, you have to connect with Jesus and you have to depend upon Jesus as your life to work not only in you, but to work through you. That's how you serve the Lord. He works through you because you're depending upon him. That's how God gets his work done in this earth. That's how God gets his work done in this world. That's how his redemptive plan uh, progresses and goes forward. You and I yoke up with Jesus, and we depend upon him to move us and to use us, to work through us, to accomplish his will, to accomplish his plan. We don't fight against him. We don't try to pull this way or that way. We walk in a straight line with him, and he does the pulling, and we just walk with him. We're depending upon him. That's why he says, my yoke is easy. He works through you. You'll never rest in serving the Lord until you find yourself depending upon, relying on Jesus to work through you. You know the truth. You're in Christ. Christ is in you. But have you then gone to the next step? Christ lives and works through you. If he's in you already, that's what he wants to do. He wants to take you to the next step where he works through you, serves through you. Well, you think about it. This yoke, <clears throat> we're to take his yoke. It's pretty confining when you think about it. Those, those animals, when they're put in a yoke, they're given boundaries. They're given, given, given limitations. They can't wander all over as perhaps they would and, and do as they please. When we are yoked to Jesus, when we have willingly, wholeheartedly cooperated with God in serving, you know what? We'll walk in a straight line with him. We won't be wandering to the right and to the left. You'll be led by the Spirit. Is really you'll be willing to cooperate with him. You'll be contented to accept his limits and to go along with Jesus. There's a second thing that really defines what spiritual rest is about. Not only take my yoke, but in verse 29, he says, learn of me. Learn of me. That word learn is the word that we get our word disciple from. That's why I'm saying he's talking to followers. He says, learn of me. Be discipled by me. Learn of me. You know, learning takes time. You don't learn overnight. Learning of Jesus takes time. And it's the result of you simply coming to him to learn. Come unto me. All ye that are weary, heavy laden, I'll give you rest. And you get that rest by coming to him to learn. Lord, teach me. I'm coming to you to learn of you. Genuine discipleship. But although 
it takes time, it's worth it because it's infinitely rewarding. When you take his yoke, that pertains to service. When you learn of him, I think this pertains to sanctification. Remember we said you get weary when you try to serve in your own effort? That's taking the yoke. That's how you rest in that area. And then I said you get weary when you try to sanctify yourself by being good enough, by doing these things so that people will think well of you, to impress either man or God. Well, here's the answer to that. Learn of me, Jesus says. It pertains to how you can become godly, how you can become holy, how you can become more like Jesus, conform to the image of uh, God's dear son. Learn of me. What should we learn of him? See what he says there in that verse? Learn of me, for I am meek. I am meek. Meekness is really the first step to a sanctified life. Meekness is humbleness. Meekness is submissiveness. Meekness is you submit your will to the Lord. You submit your choices to him. You accept God's dealing with you without disputing with him, without resisting him, because you view all God's dealing with you as good because you know who he is. You're the object of his love. Then you know whatever he deals with, uh, deals in your life is good because you're the object that he loves. He loves you. And so he's only going to deal in your life, things that are going to result in good. So to learn of him is to learn meekness, have his meekness formed in you, his meekness transferred from him into your life. That will sanctify your life. That's where it starts with meekness. Someone Again, to use a horse illustration, I don't know why, but someone has defined meekness as power under restraint. And you think, as I mentioned, that workhorse, that's a powerful beast. That's a powerful animal. I mean, for torture, they used to tie two horses uh, to one, uh, one leg of a man and another horse to the other leg of the man and pull them apart. Uh, those are powerful animals, suffice it to say. But you can take a, a powerful animal like that and have that animal with just a, a whistle or, you know, uh, just a, a, a slight tug on the rein, go where you want them to go and do what you want them to do. That is a wonderful picture of meekness, power or strength that is, un that, that is under control. Under God's, that's meekness. He says, take my yoke upon you, learn of me, for I am meek. So you have his meekness transferred into your life, and it's his meekness in you. And by the way, isn't that a fruit of the Spirit? You see, the Holy Spirit, he's the one that gives meekness to us. Now, I don't know about you, but I don't consider myself a naturally meek person. I can pretend to be meek at the right time, but inside I'm not meek. Even though I might be pretending, I'm not meek. You know, uh, kids, you can pretend to be meek and uh, submit to your parents' will, but inside you're full of rebellion, perhaps, at the same time. That's not meekness. Meekness that we're talking about here is something that the Holy Spirit of God produces. It's his spiritual fruit, and it's the spirit of Jesus that to produces meekness in us. And again, these things don't happen by accident. This does, you learn of him. There's a course you have to go through. And you know what? Learning's difficult. Learning's hard. I mean, how many could honestly raise their hand and said, I loved every year of school I went to. <laughs> it was just so joyful. 
All those tests and papers we had to write. Oh, that was so much fun. Wish I could repeat it again. <laughs> Learning's difficult. And we complain, don't we? But learning of him. Learning and as a result, absorbing and having him by his spirit when we ask, be filled with his meekness. Learn of me. So there is... There is an instantaneous fruit of the spirit called meekness. Even though you haven't learned of him, you can call upon the Holy Spirit at a, a moment of time when you need it, and he can give you meekness. He can give you self-control. But there's also, I believe here, a deeper aspect of that meekness where it becomes it becomes a part of you. It's who you are. It defines your character. You've gone through the course with Jesus and you have learned and he has instilled and he has transferred his meekness into your life. And that's the course of your life now. That's how you are defined as a meek person. Remember Moses? In Numbers chapter 12, he's called the meekest man on the earth at that time. How do you think that happened? He spent 40 days learning, or 40 years rather, learning that course of meekness on the backside of the desert. That doesn't come naturally. He learned that meekness, and this is what he's saying here. You want to rest? You have to learn meekness. My meekness. It's a submission of your human will. In your soul, you have a will. In your heart, you have a will. In your heart, you have a place where you make up your mind. You make choices and decisions every day. That's your will. That has to be submitted to Jesus. When that's submitted to him, he works meekness in your life. He says, <clears throat> come unto me. If you're weary, heavy laden, take my yoke. And then learn of me because I am not only meek, I am lowly in heart. Lowly in heart. So I would say that if meekness is a submission of your will to God, that lowliness is a submission of your thinking, your mind, and your affections to God. By that I mean you don't think big things about yourself any longer. You don't think uh, uh, ambitious, selfish things about yourself. You're willing for God to uh, uh, to appoint you at any place, even if that place is at the very bottom of the rung, the very uh, bottom rung of the ladder. It doesn't matter to you. Lowliness, he says, uh, lowly in heart. It's the submission of your thinking and also your affections. When your soul is your will, it's your mind, which is your thinking, and it is your affections, which not only entails your emotions, but entails your desires and your ambitions uh, and uh, all that you would think makes life good for you. You learn of him. And as a result, you become not only, not only uh, absorb his meekness, you absorb his lowliness, where you submit your thinking to him. And you think, his thoughts after him. You think on those things that he wants you to think on. You're thinking, you're not thinking merely on uh, about things on this earth all the time. You're thinking about Christ and where he's seated at the right hand and all that pertains to him. You're thinking on heavenly things more than you're thinking on earthly things. It's a submission of your mind, your thinking, and your affections, your desires, your ambitions your goals in life, what you want to be in life doesn't matter. What matters is, Lord, you can put me, you can place me. The place of my appointment is up to you wherever it is, whatever it is. That's lowliness. Learn of me. Meekness and lowliness. In closing, I think that there's one great illustration of this, and I'm not going to have you turn there. But if you want to look at it later, the reference is Luke 10, I think it's verse 38 to 42. 
And it pictures the difference between a weary and heavy laden believer and someone who is enjoying rest unto their soul. It's two sisters. One's called Martha. The other one's called Mary. Martha, she is a picture of a believer that is weary and heavy laden. Oh, she's busy. She is all about serving the Lord. She is busy preparing some delicious meal for him. And may I say, Martha acknowledged that Jesus was present, and she even welcomed him, welcomed his presence. But you know what's different about her? She was never helped by the presence of God in her home. You can believe, as, you, as a believer, you can really know that God's present with you, and you can welcome his presence with you, but it's possible that you're never helped by his presence, like Martha. You know what Jesus says of her? Martha, here I am, present in your home, and you're cumbered about. You're, you're, you're burdened down. You're full of care. You're troubled. You're being pulled to pieces by all of your anxiety in your soul. And here I am present with you. And you've asked me to come. You've welcomed me into your home. You've welcomed my presence into your life. And yet it hasn't helped you at all. On the other hand, Mary, she not only acknowledges Jesus' presence and welcomes Jesus' presence, but different from her sister, she's quiet. She's still. She's at Jesus' feet. She's not serving him. Oh, no. She's not showing him hospitality. She's not knocking herself out. She's still quiet, sitting at Jesus' feet. And she's enjoying being together in his presence, listening to him and absorbing his every word. That's the difference between Martha's a restless Christian, a weary Christian. Mary's a restful believer who has a deep, abiding inner peace in her heart given her by the Lord. She discovered that. Have you? You know how to relax now?